My name is Beatrice Taylor. So my name is Annalisha Boudreau. Oh, my name is Edna Gibson. Edna Jean Gibson. Since I've been through prison, been in prison 32 years, I've come to find out that the relationship I had was a toxic relationship. Met a man and my life got turned upside down. He was very jealous of the relationship between me and my kids. Things ended up getting so bad that my sister intervened and had them taken away from me. I met someone who portrayed himself as a happy-go-lucky man, but he was totally the opposite. He was a career batterer. He was, uh, he was hurting me. He was physically um, violent. If your man didn't hit you, he didn't love you. If you didn't fight, it wasn't love. That was, to me, the part of communicating. He isolated me away from my mom and them. Me and him ended up getting into a another altercation, and I was able to dial 911 that time. And police called, and it didn't always end up with a police report. In fact, I don't think I ever did a report because he was so good at this. When officers got there, he had fled the scene. His experience at leaving when the police had been called was always the same. What the police found was a hysterical woman and nothing else. I hear a knock on the door and I open it thinking it was my sister and it wasn't her. It was his drug dealer. So I was like, can you just take me to my parents' house? He said, grab what you can and I'll take you. And that's not where I ended up. Had my clothes taken off of me. I was beat. And they locked me into a bedroom. There were break-ins of windows, locks, deadbolts, then the entire front door. The night before all this began, I called police. They responded. But this time they got there before he could leave and they made him leave. And my husband and I, we would uh, fight a lot. So um, one night, we had an altercation. I stabbed him in the chest. He died from a single stab wound. He hit me, I stabbed him in the chest one time. My ex-husband had called him and told him to come out there to see if I was still there and if I was to do whatever he wanted to with me for payment for his drug debt. So many people came over there and they did whatever they wanted to to me. And by 11 o'clock that night, he was calling. He wanted to come get his work boots. He came to my house for his work boots. He began attacking me. During his attack, I grabbed a knife to escape from him. I did not want him to get hurt. He ended up dying. Must have one. This one man, he was pretty frequent. And he came in and raped me. He walked out of the room, and then it wasn't long after that, he came back in there, said that we were there alone. So he let me out. And I seen an opportunity to run from him, and I ran. It's not, it's not like something that um, I should have planned, but that's what I was charged, that I actually planned it. That's what second degree murder is. With specific intent to kill or cause great bodily harm. The officer that arrived on the scene, um, he said, I know what you're doing. You're high, you're out here looking for your next high, prostituting for your high. My charge was 
it was second degree murder. They found me guilty of second degree murder. And gave me a life sentence. I blame myself over and over for cause I, ref I refused to listen to the advice of my mom. The whole time I was there in that house, the only thing that kept me going is I could literally hear my kids' voices saying, Mama, don't give up. Mama, we need you. And I haven't still been able to see them. I've tried making contact with them. I've called him, I've texted him. I've sent gifts through my mom. I've sent letters through my mom where she would actually in person take all these things to them for their birthdays, Christmas. She would send me videos of it and they won't let me talk to them. I believe I lost myself, lost my emotions. I forgot how to be human. Prisons are where Society discards their mistakes. And these people are not mistakes. They made mistakes. And they're punished because they made mistakes. I was punished for surviving. I was a criminalized survivor. My name is Katie Hunter Lowry. LSR welcomes survivors of systemic and interpersonal violence, homicide victims, loved ones, and allies and advocates because I mean, we're all touched by violence and we're all impacted when um, our communities aren't safe. There is no victim offender binary. We're told that there's victims of violence on one side and there's offenders on the other. And that's just not actually the way it works. That's not the human experience. That's not the way communities are experiencing um, violence and criminalization. So the clearest example of that, I think, is the work that we're doing with the Justice for Survivors Act, because these are survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence and human trafficking who, instead of receiving help from the systems that they're told to reach out to, to get and stay safe, they were criminalized by those systems. The Justice for Survivors Act is a bill that would prevent the criminalization of survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual abuse. It also would provide relief for survivors who are currently incarcerated. The Human Trafficking Prevention Commission has given, it gave the bill a unanimous recommendation as a legislative priority. The bill is currently written has three main components to address the criminalization of survivors. The first is a justification defense, which would be a legal defense the same way that self-defense is a defense or stand your ground is a defense. And because of you know various factors within the legal system, sexism and racism, those other defenses have not protected uh, survivors of abuse in these situations. The second uh, big part of it would be providing for expert testimony in these cases. You know, the so, so many survivors who have been convicted, the evidence of what they had been through in these abusive situations has been completely left out of their trial. And then the third piece is this bill as written would um, provide a mechanism to make a motion for a new trial for survivors who are currently incarcerated. We need folks to contact their legislators and tell them they support the Justice for Survivors Act. Um, we need folks to be working in their own communities to educate. We've been doing these panels across the state and it would be amazing to have more of them hosted by, by folks all over the place. We also need people to express to their district attorneys that they don't want to see domestic violence and sexual abuse and human trafficking survivors in prison, that prison is no place for survivors. The internalized not that bad, that 
I did to myself for a long time and that, you know, I know other survivors do where, you know, yes, I witnessed a homicide, but it wasn't someone that I knew and loved. And so that experience is not that bad. Or yes, I was raped by someone that I was dating and that was horrific and, you know, the worst experience of my life, but I didn't have to go to the hospital. So it's not that bad. I don't believe that anymore. And um, I know that my like, that what happened to me shouldn't have happened and that my experience is valid. And um, I lived with so much guilt and shame for so long because, well, when I was raped, you know, I just laid there and I didn't fight back. And I always thought of myself as a person who would fight back in those situations. If I had fought back, something that, you know, I told myself for years I should have done, if I had fought back, I could be in prison right now. It has been really, really activating to work on this topic, but it feels worth it. And I, uh, yeah, I believe that we're gonna, that we are gonna succeed.